if you can figure it out, like you may not make those. Yeah. Oh, welcome. Thank you for attending. You may be wondering why I called you here. Uh, in case of depressurization, the exits are here, here, and here. Are we, all right. I, I show we still have one minute, but who's, who's in favor of getting started? All right. Okay, well, welcome to Bootstrapping Your Author Career. I'm Kevin Tomlinson. You may know me from a variety of places. Draft to Digital is kind of the reason I'm here right now. How many of you use Draft to Digital? All right. We do bring that up in the talk. The, the whole talk isn't about D2D, so don't worry. Um, I'm also a podcaster. I had a show called The Wordslinger Podcast for several years. Uh, anybody heard of me from that? Okay, all right. Thank you. You were the listener. I appreciate that. Um, and I'm an author in my own right. I'm a thriller author. I'm a best-selling and award-winning thriller author. Uh, I've been doing this. I've been writing my entire life. Uh, but I started uh, self-publishing back in around 2008 after leaving a traditional contract. Um, but the, that was actually the moment at which I discovered the power of bootstrapping my career. And I discovered it because I had no choice. I had no money. Uh, no platform, no opportunities. And so if I was going to have a publishing career, it was going to be because I yanked myself up out of the muck by my own uh, arm strength. So that's what I'm going to be talking about a bit today. Now, I've, I've tailored this. I, I've done this talk in the past. I'm true confession here. I didn't know I was giving this talk until last week when someone mentioned it. Turns out that Craig had just put me on the schedule. Uh, so figuring you'll, I'll figure it out. So, uh, but I've done this talk a lot of times we're we're going to roll through it. So, the uh, I was talking to someone earlier and I want to reiterate this idea, but the idea here is that this is a no to low budget uh plan. It's an approach to writing and publishing that if you have money or you don't have money, you can still use all of these tools. Um so let's take a look. So first up, I tailored this whole thing around first the original audience I did this for, uh, many of them had not actually ever even written a book. So there is a huge component about writing in this. If it seems like that is uh, not needed, you guys are all like, now how many of you have only, well, or it, how many of you have not written or published yet? Okay, okay, good, okay, so we're good, all right. So uh, first up, what is bootstrapping? The, uh, the gist of it, and I could have given you a dictionary definition that I didn't like it, uh, but the definition I kind of work from is it's, uh, I'm, instead of a definition, I'm going to give you some examples. So if you were an entrepreneur and you were starting a company with no money, uh, there are people who do this in Silicon Valley all the time, and they usually go around trying to get venture capitalists to back their idea. So that would be one version of bootstrapping. Another version of, of an entrepreneur doing that is the guy who started a company in his garage um, and built it from absolute scratch. That's actually the story of Draft Digital. They, they bootstrapped that company as a startup. Uh, three guys, one was an author, two were programmers, uh, it started off as one, the author really just wanted a way to get his Google Docs uh, in, turned into EPUBs and distributed, and a legend was born. Um, software developers that create something in their, their spare time, any kind of creator uh, working in their spare time. Uh, and of course, the one that's applicable to us is authors who are building a, pub a publishing career straight up from scratch. Uh, this, this could be you, or you may be much more successful and you're just slumming it in this talk, in which case, welcome. Uh, so the bare minimum for an author career, this is kind of the seven points of what, it, of what we would consider an author career, what I consider an author career. Uh, first up, you have to write the book. That's the bad news. Uh, but the good news is that once you're done with writing the book, you get to edit the book. Uh, and I know that's not always the fun part. For me, it's become the fun part over the years, actually. I used to dread editing, and now I actually look forward to that process. Uh, then there's the cover. Then there's formatting the book, distributing the book, marketing the book, and hopefully number seven, profit. So number seven is the one we all want to get to right away, but getting through those other six, that's the hard part. So first, Let's take a look at writing the book. First of all, if you do the math, oh, let me back that up, okay. 
See how that goes. Okay, uh, so do the math. So I, I wrote a book back in 2016 called 30 Day Author, and I gave this formula. So I'm gonna save you all the 499. Uh, this is really the whole gist of the book, but if you took your target word count and you divided it by the target days to complete the book, uh, your goal basically, you would end up with the number of words per day you need to finish that book in that time frame. So as the example I gave here, if you wanted to write 60,000 words in 30 days, you'd get there by writing 2,000 words per day. So for a lot of uh, authors starting out, that's actually a pretty big number, but if you can but that's, it's all adjustable. So if you decide, okay, well, I don't want to try to do it in, in 30 days, I'll do it in 60, or I'll do it in 90. And you can just adjust the numbers to get your target. As long as you hit that target every day, you're going to make that book. Some of that can be looping back to edit, which I talk a little bit about in a moment. But you can change uh, any variable in that formula to determine uh, how fast you want that book completed. So you can make that words per session, per week, per month, per year, uh, whatever works for you. The, the idea though is that consistency is what completes a book. Uh, write ugly, edit later is probably one of my, the, my favorite phrases uh, because it's the, it's the thing that hangs up almost every writer. So the idea is you want to get the words on the page. If you stop to edit uh, every time you write, if you're waiting for that wor those words to be perfect whenever you write, you're, you're going to exponentially increase the odds that you do not ever finish that book. And I know this from personal experience because I have a whole digital stack of books on my hard drive that did not get finished within the first 20 some odd years of my life. Um, but once I figured out that formula that I shared and started committing to doing that every day, the consistency produced a book. The, the key was don't try to edit as you write. Wait until you've got something to edit and then edit. Um, so writing ugly, I already covered that, but uh, I stole an idea from Dean Wesley Smith in his book, Writing Into the Dark. Uh, he calls it cycling. And the idea is to write 500 words, cycle back, edit those 500 words, and go on. Any words you add during that process, by the way, count towards your daily total. So that's, if, if you just cannot resist editing, this is the way I would do it. Set a target, go back, rewrite through that target, and then continue on. And what you have is a, a steady momentum as you write. I do, uh, I use what I call looping. I had to change the term because it's slightly different from what Dean uh, advocates, but looping is a similar process. So each day I get up and let's say my set my target as 2000 words per day. Um, I'll write 2000 words. The next day I'll read through and edit those 2000 words and generally add to it as I'm going, you know, you usually add words, uh, but I clean all that up. That helps me get in, back into the story and keep my momentum. And as soon as I'm done with the 2,000 words, I rock, or with those 2,000 words, I rock on and finish my 2,000 word word count. So it's a way to continuously keep yourself in the story, or in if you're a nonfiction writer, in the narrative, uh, and so that you can you can keep up your momentum and finish the book. The alternate that I offer people is you could write on one day and edit on the other, um, and just sort of alternate days like that, and that's an equally valid process. The thing that people don't stop to think about when it comes to editing is that it, it, is, it can be an additive process. It can be part of the writing process. And a lot of times they'll, they'll say, you know, you want to edit down and take out as many words as possible, which is also uh, valid. Uh, but, you know, in terms of finishing the book, I'd say don't bother trying to be concise on that first pass. Just try, to get his, just try to get the story down as quickly as possible. Um, there is a concept in publishing called, this is, this is where we start shifting a little bit away from writing and into some of the other parts of bootstrapping, but it's important to have this foundation. There's an, a concept in marketing called minimal viable product or MVP. And the, you may have heard this term, and, uh, but what's important to realize is, is, first of all, this is not rush to publish the book. This isn't write as fast as possible and put up that unedited manuscript. That's a surefire way to achieve absolutely nothing with your author career except wasting a whole lot of time. Uh, but what it is, 
is that you, you are creating the best possible book with the resources that you have. This is where the bootstrapping part starts to kick in. Um, a lot of the writers that you know best, the ones that you love most, they have teams. Uh, either, if they're self-publishing, they probably have a team of readers and editors who help them. They probably have an actual editor that goes over their manuscript. They have a cover designer. They have all these resources. And on the traditional side, some of those things, if not all those things, are provided by the traditional publisher. Uh, when you're starting off from zero, you don't have any of that. Uh, so you want to leverage the resources that you have, and the aim is to get that book into as, as close to perfect shape as possible. Um, there's a process that a lot of us use that we call iterate and optimize. Uh, to iterate means to, to evolve it to the next level, take another shot at it, and improve it as you go. Optimize, of course, means to make it, you know, that's the improving part, actually, but you want to you wanna be in a mindset of every time you go back to that book, back to that manuscript, it, the idea is to make it better. Uh, the same is true even after it's launched. I have early works that I released that had tons of typos and had other issues, and what I did was every time someone complained to me about that book, every time someone wrote a bad review or sent me a negative email about it, I would thank them for that feedback, invite them to get on my street team, which is my uh, initial like beta readers, ARC readers, uh, and then I'd leverage the free feedback they gave me to improve the book. So that's, that's iterate and optimize in a nutshell. Uh, and this is actually a strength that we have over traditional publishing, because if you are in a trad pub house, you don't get the option to improve the book after it's gone live. What, any typo you have in that book is, probably going to be a typo for life. So bootstrapping, uh, the other aspect of this is a lot of times what we have are these, these little things we call day jobs or other obligations that might just take us away from the writing. The most important pro part of this process, if you haven't guessed by now, is to have a book. Uh, and the only way you have a book is to write that book. And the only way you, you finish the book is to come back to it consistently. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that when you're a bootstrapper, you don't typically have tons of time. You have to work in the gaps. Uh, early in my career, I wrote, you know, I'd get up at 4 in the morning and I'd write until I had to leave for work around 6.30. I'd write at lunchtime. I'd write in any breaks I had. I'd write after work. Uh, that, those were early days, and the, that was the only way I was going to produce that work. So there are a lot, you, you can write, there's uh, always an opportunity, there's always gaps in your day where you can do the right. Now, energy management is a whole other topic, but if you can get yourself into the headspace of, I've got 10 minutes, I'm going to write five words, you'll make better progress than if you stress out about it and say, I've, I've got to figure out how to get at least two hours a week to write. Um, so look for all those opportunities. You can write while traveling. One of my favorite, I'm, I'm going to tell a story, by the way, in just a moment that uh, some of you may find pretty interesting. But, um, you know, we've always got our devices with us, right? We, we've always got a phone with us. If you're welcome, man, I, I love when I've gone through a presentation 20 times and I still spot a typo. Um, <laughs> so, you, uh, and I don't know how that typo got there, actually. Uh, but, you know, we... I write a lot on airplanes. Uh, if I can have my laptop or an iPad or something, I, I'll use that. Uh, I'll, I'm in the bathroom. Everyone goes to the bathroom. There's a whole book on the subject. Everybody poops, right? So if you poop, you might also be able to use that time to get a few words down. And, uh, you know, if you're okay with that, my wife is not okay with that. I'm okay with that. Um, and writing in line is also an option. And I, there is a, okay. I tell this story all the time. It's a bit of a brag, but it's also meant to illustrate a point. I was in uh, Orlando at a book conference, at a uh, author conference, and I had a four-day layover before another conference that was going to take place in Tampa. So I wasn't going anywhere. If you find yourself stuck in Orlando, it is it is legally required of you to go to Disney World. I mean, there, I think you can actually go to jail if you don't. So I t I booked a little time to go and uh, look, if, if you have never been to Disney World by yourself, I highly recommend the experience. 
Because nobody's telling you which rides to ride. Nobody's telling you when you can eat or what you can eat. It's, it's heaven, okay? So I, uh, I ended up in a line for a ride in Animal Kingdom. They have their whole little avatar section. They have a ride called Flight of Passage, which was relatively new at that point. The, the average wait time was 3.5 hours. So uh, I decided, you know what? I'm here by myself. I'm going to do it. I got in line and I thought, well, I'll just, you know, everyone I knew was at work or was busy. You know, I couldn't chat on my phone. And I thought, well, I'll just chat up this nice fellow. And turns out that nice fellow spoke German. And so did the 50 or so other people surrounding me and not a word of English. So uh, when you're stuck in line with nothing else to do, why not whip out your phone and write? So I took out my phone. I opened, I used Scrivener, so I opened the Scrivener app. I wrote a short story, and uh, then once that was done, I went on the Canva app and I created a cover for it. And then I took that to draft to digital, and was before I got on that ride, I had published a book, right from ride, uh, right from the line. So that's just meant to tell you that this is something that can be done anywhere. The minimum requirements, uh, you need a writing medium, and that could be just about anything. You can use a laptop, a tablet, a smartphone, of course, um, or you can just use pen and paper. I have, I've done little experiments where um, I, I decided I'm going to look around where I am and see if there's a writing tool here. And sure enough, I found a discarded receipt that was blank on the back, and someone had tossed a Bic pen. And I decided I'm just going to write a little short story on the back of this receipt. That's just to show that, that the means of writing is everywhere. And that is part of the uh, bootstrapping process. Software that's available to you, and, and I, I chose things that are either free or essentially free. Um, the, the medium up top, you know, the free one is probably going to be the, the paper and pen, but you probably own a smartphone at the, at the minimum. Uh, Google Docs is a, is a great office type uh, software that's free online. Open Office is another. If you're an Apple user, you get access to Apple Pages. And, a, and surprising to me, as of this morning, it, actually, I noticed that Canva actually has a document formatting tool uh, in which you can actually do writing format for uh, if you want to create a flyer or something like that. Uh, but you can format it as a Word document and export that. So Canva it has a free version and an inexpensive paid version. Uh, cover design, we're back to Canva. There's, there's actually an ebook template on Canva that you can use. I recommend uh, changing the photo that comes default with whatever template you pick because everybody thought of, hey, that's a great photo and went and used that photo. Trust me, it happens. Um, GIMP Shop is a free version of Photoshop that you can download. It's an open source. And the last time I saw it, it was nearly identical to Adobe Photoshop. And Midjourney. Now, here's where I bring in visual aids. Because Midjourney is an AI art program. And I have actually been using it to systematically go through and, and refresh my covers with AI-generated art. And all the images you see here were generated by artificial intelligence. With a tiny bit of Photoshop for me, mostly just to combine elements. Uh, those are all my archaeological thrillers, and then like these are technological thrillers. Like even the silhouette of the woman running is AI generated. The I pay fifty dollars a month to have access to this software. I generated every image you see here in one weekend. In fact, on one day, and I think in about a two-hour stretch. So. Um, Thus ends the visual aid portion of our program. Uh, so the next thing you want is, um, and I know everyone's going to ask me questions about that. I'm going to try to get to questions in a few minutes. The next thing is, is uh, layout and formatting. There's an application called LaTeX, which is mostly used for like technical papers and things, but it's an, I believe it's still free, but uh, that's a, it's a little bit of a learning curve. People have used that. I don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, but I've known plenty of authors who've used that for formatting. But Apple Pages comes on uh, all of your Apple devices, and that actually has an ebook formatting tool built into it. Uh, I believe Word might have that. But of course, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Draft to Digital has a free formatting tool with templates. If you've ever seen or used Vellum, we have a, basically a free version of Vellum. It's not quite as robust, but it produces beautiful 
uh, ebook and print book layouts for no charge whatsoever, and I promise you, honest, no charge. Uh, I've had people kind of ask about that, and I'll be happy to talk about that later. Uh, I'm sorry, forgot to turn off that alarm. Um, Internet access, this is increasingly important in our world. Uh, you can generally get online almost anywhere, just not in this hotel, apparently. Um, but you can go to Starbucks, libraries, uh, even grocery. I've, I cannot tell you how many times I've done live streams from uh, the Kroger's that was near my home. Uh, just because I was trying to get out of the house or I had a service issue or something. So I've done tons of that. We were doing van life for two years, so I was broadcasting from all kinds of remote places and grocery stores oddly have some of the most reliable Wi-Fi. And then you need a publishing portal. I'm gonna just straight up recommend draft to digital um, because that will get you pretty much everywhere. Uh, KDP uh, is Amazon's arm, you've probably heard of that. Uh, and there are possibly others. Um, that's a rumor, I'm not gonna confirm or deny. What I've noticed though, and I mentioned this a bit, is that Canva, like I say here, they're, they're quietly becoming the everything content creation tool. So if, if nothing else, take a look at Canva and see what you can accomplish. I mean, so far I've seen document creation, web design, uh, the graphic design stuff, of course, but also video editing. Uh, so a remarkable amount of stuff can be done with that Canva account. Um, gear, oh, hold on, let's go back. There we go. This is my favorite part because I love, I'm a tech head, but you probably already have everything you need to, to do this work, okay? So what bootstrapping comes down to is get creative with the resources you have. Bootstrapping is all about resource thinking. That's, and this is one of my favorite topics. It's, uh, and my, it drives my wife nuts because she'll come to me and say, I want, let me give you a great example. Hey, Kevin, here's a picture of a Pottery Barn fireplace I'd like to buy. It costs $2,000. I say, hey, Kara, here's a picture of a fireplace on Amazon that only cost me $400. We should use that and just modify it. Um, and then when we got that fireplace, it was all banged up and broken and missing the instructions. And so I had to figure out how to build it from scratch. But what we ended up with was a beautiful fireplace that cost us practically nothing. I even got a refund on like more than half of it, 60% of it. So I paid like a hundred bucks for that fireplace. But the, the, the point of that is, this was this resource that otherwise we would have spent a ton of money on, but very frugal Kevin decided we could get it for a lot less, um, just utilizing what we had. So uh, you probably have, if you don't have a laptop, it's very likely you have at least a tablet or possibly a, uh, you probably have a smartphone. You can pick up smartphones these days. I mean, I've seen prepaid phones uh, for as little as 30 bucks. Um, that's a very minimal investment to get started. Uh, by the way, looping back, and we'll talk about it in a second actually, but there, there are free ways to do the writing as well. Uh, but if you can at least pop 20 or 30 bucks, you can actually have a pretty nice setup. If you look, there's that folding pocket keyboard there. So that phone that's on there, like that keyboard to the right, that LG keyboard, I actually have that keyboard. And I have a little, you may have noticed, I have a kickstand on my phone. So I have very often gone to conferences where the only device I carried with me was that phone and that keyboard. And I would do my presentations, I would do my writing, I can publish from the phone as we discussed earlier. So I have this love for the whole smartphone movement because it's the everything technology. It's one device to rule them all. I, I can literally do every single bit of my work from this phone. You probably have one too. Uh, and in a pinch, I do a, an awful lot of writing with my thumbs and it's not as bad as you might think. I've written, I've written at least three novels using nothing but my thumbs in this phone. Um, so as you can see, and I dropped in some prices for a comparison here. I found laptops for under 150 bucks. Uh, tablets, you can, you know, depending on what type of tablet you want, you can usually get one. Uh, if you want an iPad, you're gonna pay Apple premiums, but you can usually get some sort of Android device for, you know, all, all the way down to like $50. And if you are uh, really frugal, you can hit like pawn shops and things and find this stuff for, you know, I've, I bought my wife a MacBook Pro for $60 at a pawn shop. Um, all right, we got 20 minutes. 
And here's the, here's the other gear you can always fall back on. This is, this is cutting edge technology, but pen and paper is not a bad way to go. A lot of authors still use pen and paper now. Neil Gaiman writes all of his books in, in uh, it used to be Moleskines, and now it's the Lick, Lick Turn, Lick Turn, the German one. Uh, he, does it, he uses a fountain pen and a notepad and writes every single book that way in first draft. You can do that too. And getting it onto, into digital format, if you can't afford a device of your own, public libraries will let you use a computer and you can access all these, these pieces of technology from a public library system. And there's no charge. So there, there is always a way to do this. Uh, marketing, and I think this is one that I think a lot of people are probably waiting to hear, but uh, first, yes, it is entirely possible to market with no budget. Uh, because you, the thing that you have to keep in mind is that what you probably think of as marketing isn't all that marketing is. I, have a, I tell people that uh, my definition of marketing is ensuring that your product, your book, whatever it is, making sure your book is available and ready to be purchased by the right reader at the right time, which is the time they're ready to buy it. That's marketing. Whatever you can do to improve the odds of that happening, that's marketing. So there are, the, first of all, uh, we talked about resource thinking. That's this next line, gather your assets. Who do you know? Uh, what resources do you already have? Do you have an in with somebody? Um, there is a tool uh, out there you may have heard of called Book Funnel, uh, created by my good friend, uh, Damon Courtney. Highly recommend that as a way to help you build your mailing list. But the, uh, one of the additional perks of that is uh, if you're paying his monthly fee to, to be on there, the subscription rate, uh, he has all these promotions, these cross promotion opportunities. You can sign up based on genre and he'll send you any, the service will send you an email and say there's a promotion, a mail, an email swap, or uh, we're all sharing our links to our first in series or whatever. You'll get all those promotions that you can use to help promote your work. And it's usually just a cooperative thing, no extra charge. Um, this is why, by the way, having a mailing list is very important. If you have a mailing list, you can participate in cross promotion a lot easier. Um, Define and build your platform. Is, is your platform an email list? It should, it should include an email list. Uh, is it social media? Do you have a podcast? Do you have a blog? Are you doing content creation? A platform means that you, it's, it's the circle of reach that you have. Any human being that you can influence is part of your platform. So if you have a mailing list, which I do highly recommend, Everyone who subscribed to that mailing list is part of your platform, but everyone who follows you on social media is also part of that platform. And right now, right in this space, you guys are all part of my platform. I'm able to reach and influence you from this podium. So you, all you have to do is start thinking about how, how many people do I know and how many people do they know and how do I get those people to start talking to each other and sharing my book and you've, and you've already raced ahead in terms of marketing. Um, you do wanna focus on growing your platform and you might say, but Kevin, how do I grow my platform? And I'm glad you asked that question because otherwise this slide would make no sense. Uh, growing your platform, first of all, ask for what you want. It's the simplest, stupidest thing and it's the one thing that almost every author forgets to do. Ask for what you want. Um, if you, you have no idea how many people are actually sitting around, literally just waiting for someone to ask them to, to help them, you know? I mean, if someone walked up to you and said, I really need your help, I, I would wager that most of you, I mean, there's a couple of you in the back that maybe not, uh, but I would wager that most of you would be willing to help them. This conference, by the way, is that idea personified. Everybody who is here got here because someone else was willing to help them. And then almost everyone who was helped here asked for that help in some way. So number one, uh, give them a why. There's a book called Influence um, that I, I also highly recommended to read. I cannot remember the author at this time. Uh, but the general concept was if you can give someone a reason, the word because is a magic word. 
if you, they, what they did was run some experiments and they had someone go into a line at like a FedEx copy center uh, and they'd walk to the head of the line and they'd say to the person in the front of the line, do you mind if I go ahead of you and make my copies? Because I only have to make 100. And 99% of the time, that person would let that person go ahead. Then they would vary the experiment. Do you mind if I cut ahead of you? Because I have a sick aunt who lives a thousand miles away from here. Something along those lines, some ridiculous context. And they'd still get the same number. It was the because that was giving that person the excuse to help them out. People by default, we're all sort of raised by good mamas and daddies and grannies. And we're all told, you know, be polite to people, treat people the way you want to be treated. And if I needed help, I would hope that someone would help me. So giving me a reason, giving me an excuse to help, that's going to that's gonna get you more results. I'm going to race through. I'm, I see my time. I'm, I'm in orange right now. We're conditioned orange. Um, be specific, be honest, be vulnerable, or as I like to sum it up, be personable. When I send email newsletters, my, object, my objective is to be personable. That, it's not the same as personal. I send an email to my list and I say, I will tell them stories that have nothing to do with buy my book. It'll be things along the lines of, uh, you know, I had a, I had a uh, tense, sore shoulder or bicep, it was cramping up and so I have this TENS unit and so I attached the TENS unit to my arm but I forgot to check what it was set to. So when I turned it on, it was set to like full, full blast and my arm started to spasm and my immediate reaction was to reach and grab the leads with the other hand. So now both hands are in spasm and I can't get the thing to shut off. And so I told that story and I got more positive feedback on that email. Like I had, I had thousands of people on my list. So thousands of people writing back to basically gently call me an idiot. But I also saw, by the way, not a single mention of buy my books in that email. I saw a huge spike in book sales for like the next three days. All because I, I was personable. I shared some, I, you don't have to tell them about your personal life, your kids, your wife, or any of that. Uh, but share something that it reveals who you are. That's being personable. Uh, everything you do, everything you do online or elsewhere points back to the books. If you have a social media uh, profile and you do not have a link to where people can find your books, shame on you, go back and do it again. If you are posting online, you do not, do not spam everybody all the time with buy my books, but make sure that the content you're sharing can somehow nurture that relationship. It can be personable. It doesn't have to be directly about the books, but make sure that the idea is make them like me enough to check out my profile and then periodically share a link to buy your books. Make sure that you, everything you're doing, every conversation you have can somehow come. I'm, I can't tell you how often I just casually somehow miraculously work into any conversation. Yeah, I'm an author. Every time, 100% of the time, I meet a stranger, they're going to know I'm an author before they leave. Uh, don't be obnoxious about it, but be sort of obnoxious about it. Uh, growing your platform, give something to get something. You're going to want to give them like a free short story, a free book, a free chapter, uh, some sort of behind the scenes interview. Give them something to encourage them to get on your list. This is where Book Funnel, by the way, comes in very handy. I, that short story I told you about that I wrote at Disney World, that's my free offer on my website now. You can go get, it's called the Janai Sigil, uh, not Janny Sigil, the way some people uh, want to create, it's the Janai Sigil. It's available for free on my website. Feel free to go check that out. Uh, engage regularly, once a week is probably fine, uh, depending on the, the type of content, once a month. As long as you're consistent about it, it's up to you. It's what works best for you. Make the whole thing a conversation. I ask a lot of open-ended questions. Uh, things like, you know, hey, what's your, what's your five favorite movies? What, do you, what did you think about this television show? You know, which books are you reading right now? These are questions that can't be answered in a simple yes or no. Uh, and they, these people will write back to you. Here's the secret to success. Respond to them. You would not believe how excited some readers get when they take the chance and they email you and you respond. I will 100% of the time get an email back from those folks that says, I never thought you'd respond. This is so exciting. I love your books. 
you know, and then they go buy something, which is my, that's my favorite thank you. Uh, every reader is valuable. Every reader is important. So treat them that way. So remember that you are the brand. You're, you want to make yourself the thing that people are following. Because I started my career writing science fiction, and I started cultivating a sci-fi reading audience, but I switched genres somewhere along the way to start writing thrillers, and somehow those people still followed me anyway. They still read my stuff. In fact, some of them, some of the folks who were the earliest folks on my reading list are still my biggest fans, they're my biggest readers. And it's because I, I nurtured a relationship in which I was the reason they were there, not necessarily an individual book or a character or a genre. So focus your efforts on building yourself as the brand. If you have no budget, uh, aim for creating as much shareable content as possible. You don't have to maintain this forever and you should only do the things that really work for you that you really like. Don't, <coughs> pardon me, sorry about that, that was very loud. Um, don't do things that you hate in the name of trying to build an audience. Do the things that are fun for you that you're going to engage in and come back to, but do them regularly, consistency, consistently, and as much as possible. Uh, if you have a limited budget, I would say that if you're going to spend money on marketing and promotion, spend the majority of that money on building your platform. And usually I tell people, build your mailing list. That's, that, I think that should be the primary uh, root of your platform. But if you're going to run Facebook ads, BookBub, well, BookBub's different. That's aimed at sales, but BookBub ads can actually uh, aim just about anywhere. So use all these paid ads, if you're thinking of running them, to build up your list as much as possible. Because the, that list is something you own. So when you send out an email to that list that says, I've got a new book, these people are following you as the brand. They're going to be excited about what you are offering, and they're going to be more likely to buy. Otherwise, you start spending all your time and money trying to figure out how to convince a total stranger who knows nothing about you to go buy your book. And you're spending all this money on advertising for that purpose. Your money is much better spent building up your empire. That's a controversial one, by the way. Uh, marketing with empty pockets. Use newsletters, social media, that sort of thing. I'm going to rush through these because I want to have time to take questions. Uh, make yourself valuable. It means you're giving more than you get. We really kind of talked about content marketing. Create as much as possible. Know your audience. Study your audience. Spend time with your audience. Uh, it, the better you know your audience, the easier it's going to be to market to them. And so remember, bootstrapping is really just a, it's a starting point, but it's also a fallback. There are plenty of authors who started, did pretty well, and then started seeing sales decline. And when that happens, you don't want to cut your marketing. It's a really interesting phenomenon in the corporate world. One of the first budgets to get cut is the marketing budget. If you really stop to think about it, that's the exact opposite of what they should be doing. When you're starting to see your sales dwindle, you should double your efforts to market because that's how you're going to increase sales. You're finding the customer that's going to pay you. So um, remember that if you are getting strapped for cash, there are still these techniques to use to market your work. Uh, tra transferable skills. These are skills that you could use at any level. I uh, came up as a copywriter, uh, a marketing writer, and Everything I learned about copywriting transferred into writing novels and then also transferred into marketing those novels. And all the marketing I was doing for my novels translated into marketing for draft to digital. It's the same, it's the exact same process, just bigger budgets. Um, never stop learning. Look for every resource. I'm, I'm a proud student of YouTube University. Uh, I'm constantly watching something to learn something new. I also do all my research there. You know, if I want to dig in on a topic. Uh, and always help. Because ultimately, this, this community has grown the way it has because of the willingness of everyone to help everyone else. I, one of the things that I tell people all the time uh, about my own personal story, it's like I'm working with draft to digital I've worked with them now for like seven years. I actually don't have to work for draft to digital My books make plenty of money. I was a full-time author when I offered to help them out with some marketing and they ended up hiring me. But what I discovered was how much I actually enjoyed this.
talking to people, helping authors figure stuff out, especially authors who may not have certain advantages. I love helping the author community excel at this. And so don't discount what a benefit that could be. It's, it's led to me basically having my way covered to every conference I go to, you know, meeting people in the industry I never would have met. I, I get so many, I have some opportunities come to me today simply because I'm here on behalf of draft to digital opportunities that could be become very lucrative for me. Uh, so that's it. Now, if you want to see this stuff in action, here's an example of a free offer. That's the Janai sigil or Jenny sigil. Um, if you would like that book, you can feel free to go download it. It's by no means required. Uh, KevinTomlinson.com slash join me. We have just under five minutes left. So if you have questions, rush to the microphone, tackle whoever's in front of you, spit in their face, kick them, whatever. But feel free to ask me anything. That good, huh? Okay. Oh. Uh, yes, it is. TB, and I'm going to say Cialdini, Cialdini, Robert Cialdini, Robert B. Cialdini. Yes, that is the book anyway. Yes. Titles, Influence, Cialdini. Yes. Hey, Kevin. So if you have a, a budget, but not an unlimited budget, Mm -hmm. and you had to prioritize between editing book covers or advertising, which would you choose and why? Covers. Um, editing, you can enlist the help of others, usually on a volunteer basis. If you have readers, you can, you can kind of, you'll almost always get somebody who says, hey, I noticed a typo in your book. Invite them to be a, uh, an ARC reader or a beta reader. Uh, that's what I did. I have a whole list of people who wrote me to complain about my books, and now they get a free book every, every time I release one. Oh, nice. Advertising, um, like I said, I would, only use, I would mostly use advertising to build up my platform, but advertising may not even be necessary for you. A lot, some authors, you can get by with just creating content. Uh, if you think about it, advertising is just content. So just create the content and you've got all these avenues to get that content out there with equally as much reach as most ad platforms if you do it right. So YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, uh, that's where I'd, I'd focus that promotional energy because that's a no budget approach. But if you're gonna spend money on anything, your cover is the thing that's gonna, out of those three options, your cover is the thing that's gonna win. That, that, that's what's gonna draw people to your book. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Hi. I wanted to know the name of the software you said for the, for, that you use the AI software for your covers. Uh, you, I, so there's several. There's a lot. Um, the one that I currently use is called Midjourney. Midjourney, okay. Now, it's a little tricky. There's a, there's a learning curve to figuring out how to do this. Some kung fu involved in getting this right. It also has to run on a Discord server. It's kind of like a... Yeah, okay. uh, but yes, those, those, I'm very, listen, I'm going to do the proud parent thing, but like, I'm very proud of these images. Now I still do some Photoshop work, uh, but I basically do what they call photo bashing or like kit bashing. Like these are all, all the elements. Some of these are straight out of camera. That, that book Atlantis Riddle and actually Antar Antarctic Forgery, those are straight out of camera from the AI. But there are others like uh, Quayla Medallion and, and the others uh, where I combined AI images. Uh, that's especially true for these books. They, they are uh, several, several different AI generated images combined. And I did some things on them in Photoshop, but, um, but AI generated all that. Okay, and w one other thing. When you're talking about writing something in the grocery store, is there a way you don't have to tell me what it is, but is there a way to down, to have your manuscript somehow on Word and be able to put your, put it on your phone so that you can yes make changes? Okay. okay. Microsoft Word and pretty much all word processors in Office software at this point have a cloud component. Okay. Uh, so if you were writing in Google Docs, that'd be super easy. You just need the app. Word has an app as well, but you have to pay for Microsoft in order to use that. Uh, so I, I focused primarily on the free stuff. Like I didn't mention Scrivener, which is what I use, but we only have like less than a minute though. Okay. So, okay. But thank you. And I'm, I'm going to be around if you want to grab me afterwards. 
I'll answer questions. Yes, sir. I, I actually just wanted to um, give a little advice to folks here if you're in the, the bootstrap stages. Uh, if you go to getcovers.com, you can get a fantastic ebook cover for $35. Yeah. They're, I've, I've worked with them, they're, they're fantastic. And second, um, in response to uh, which order to do things, I co wrote a book with a best selling author who somehow has become a best selling author without advertising at all. Yeah. He doesn't advertise anything. I don't advertise. And he's, he's making bank. He's not making any, he's making about half what he should if he followed yeah. the 20 books formula. Yeah. If he advertised. But still, he's making, he's making plenty of money off of it. If he started advertising, I imagine he would go through the roof, but he doesn't. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's still doing really well. So it's more about getting, he's got 40 books out. So yeah. get the books out and worry about advertising once you've built that audience. All true. Okay, that's, we're at time. Thank you so much for you know, honoring me by being here. Um, I do see that uh, they, they highly overestimated my ability to fill a room, so I appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. And I'll be around if you want to ask questions.